So here we are on the 2nd of October, 2023. And today is the day that we transition from the days of the elder tree into the days of pine. And I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint presentation and talk us through the really interesting symbolisms of pine's time of year. And it's also the first tree of the final ACMA. So we're into the final quarter of the year now. And pine is the pioneer for that. So where am I? Big. Right. So as far as the British Isles is concerned, there's one primary type of pine tree, and that is the Scots pine or the Scotch pine, Scots pine. Um, there are about 150 different species of pine throughout the world, but for the British Isles, the native pine is the Scots pine. And in the Oum, the days of pine are from the ninth degree of Libra to the 27th degree of Libra. So it's the only tree that is completely Libra. So its star law is all about Libra, of course. Now, the, the main thing of uh, Libra is that when the sun enters a sign of Libra, that's the autumn equinox. So it was during the days of the elder tree that we have the autumn equinox. And when those days finished, we're into the days of pine and pine is the first tree of the final quarter. So just to go over a bit of basic um, star law, this diagram, <clears throat> the circle is the year and there's two pillars. So on the left is a dark pillar and that's the winter solstice. And on the right, there's a white pillar, that's the summer solstice. So they're the extremes of the year, the longest day and the longest night, if you like. Um, but bisecting them is the equinox line. So close to us in the foreground, it says Aries. So when the sun enters the 30 degrees of Aries, that's the spring equinox. And it's opposite when the sun enters the 30 degrees of Libra, that's the autumn equinox. But simplistically then the sun and the solstices and equinoxes, they divide the year into two halves, if you like. There's a the lighter half of the year when the daylight hours are longer. And then there's the darker half of the year when the nighttime hours are longer. So the equinox is the dividing line for that. So here's how it fits on the Owen Grove year wheel. You can see there's a horizontal bar um, between the ash tree and the elder tree, left and right. That's your equinox line. So the ash tree holds the spring equinox, the elder tree, the autumn equinox. And so you can see how the Owen is divided into four quarters but it's literally two halves as well. So we've just spent six months in the lighter half of the year, and now we're into the six months of the darker half of the year. So here's a close-up of the lower acma, uh, the ones that are in the darker half of the year. So up by the right-hand side, you can see it says Libra, and pine is right there as the first tree of the final acma, and it will take us to gorse, heather, aspen, and then yew. Now, that's the end of the year and the rebirth of the sun at winter solstice. And then the first acma of a new wheel begins with a birch tree. But what's interesting with this final quarter is it begins with an evergreen tree, the pine tree, and it concludes with an evergreen tree, the yew tree. So it's the only acma that begins and ends with an evergreen tree. 
and that almost sets the scene for its nature you know the evergreen being uh well with the spirit world or the eternal immortal world so we're going to look at some of those ideas and um so born of the autumn equinox the final lacma also holds Samhain and concludes with the winter solstice and at Samhain there's gorse and heather which are specifically unique to wild heathland so it's perfect for the law of the wild hunt which is a big Celtic motif of course so that's definitely the theatre or theme of this quarter so you can see how pine is preparatory to the wild hunt and that's quite significant I'll come back to that so I want to draw your attention to this this is a page from the book of Ballymote this is the compilation of Oum manuscripts that were compiled in 1390 AD. Now, the famous symbol is the one in the middle, the concentric circles. That's commonly known as Finn's, Fion's window or Fion's ridge pole. But I want to draw your attention to the smaller circle on the right-hand side. There's actually a circle cut into four quarters and Inside each quarter, there are dots and what looks like a lowercase letter C for cat. Um, and if you look at the top left hand quarter, you'll see there's dot, dot and one C and then dot, 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 dot and two C's. And then it goes around the corner and there's three C's and then four C's. And it's kind of drawing your attention to a spiral that for the top left hand corner goes anti-clockwise it runs along the horizontal bar then it goes up the vertical and around it has this kind of spiral energy and each quarter of this little wheel has a different emphasis so here's a close-up and a tidier diagram so what you actually have the bottom left hand corner is the first acma it's the acma beef Top left-hand corner is the second acma, it's the Uatha acma, the Hawthorn one. Top right is the third acma, and the bottom right is the fourth acma. It starts with Aum, the acma Aum. Aum is the pine tree. But the spirals inside each quarter. So for the two lower ones, the spiral is spiraling downwards, like there's a downward energy in both quarters and the two quarters above they're spiraling upwards you know, so it's kind of like music or vibration that just energetically the two lower quarters have a downward movement or a downward dance and the two top quarters have an upward dance you know and that fits in with the the basic uh, pattern here where the two lower ones are below the equinox line they're in the darker half of the year and as opposed to the lighter upper part of the year so this is really interesting it, it's suggestive of the four acmas having a uh what well, a kind of movement or a dance either upwards or downwards now, this is a statue from Gaul, third century Celtic statue. It's called the Reims Altar, um, Romano-Celtic. But the main figure in the middle is Canunus, and below him is this red bull and a white stag. Now, the original statue is just the colour of stone. I I've taken the liberty of painting them red and white. But the stag and the bull are the key ingredients then, if you like. Now, the logic with them is that the two creatures represent the two halves of the year. Simplistically, the bull is the 
lighter half or the summer time half of the year. Um, because the bull is a domesticated animal and it was the tractor of the ancient world. It's how you plowed your fields. It's how you carried heavy loads on your carts and stuff, you know. So it was a, it was a friend to agricultural people in their farming way of life. The white stag, on the other hand, is the opposite time of year. It, it's not domesticated, it's wild, you know, and, and it lives free. And the activity of the winter time, or sort of going into winter and coming out of winter, was the season of the hunt. You know, and that goes against my grain because I've been a vegetarian for 25 years. But the Iron Age Celts, that's that's their worldview. You know, they were hunters. And uh, so their symbolism is that. So then the stag represents the winter half of the year and the bull represents the summer half of the year. Now, that's depicted way back long before the Reims altar in Gaul, you know, it's on the Gunderstrup cauldron with Canunus again. Um, to the left of him, you'll see the stag, and behind the stag is the bull. So just, it's two Canunus altars, and they're far apart. One's in Sweden, one's in southern France, but Canunus with a stag and bull, and Canunus with a stag and bull. And they're centuries apart. So it, it tells you that this is a recurring motif, if you like. Just before I move on, um, the antlers of Canunus and the antlers of the stag deliberately make a W shape. And that's Cassiopeia, the great mother goddess of the Celts. So it kind of suggests some acknowledgement to the great mother or maybe that Canunus is a consort of the goddess. They're just ideas, but it's a very deliberate W shape, which is shown on the Gunderstrup cauldron elsewhere. So another way of seeing the year in two halves then is on the left-hand side is the star map of the Milky Way. Um, in the lower area, there's a hexagon and that's the winter hexagon. And the star law story of the winter hexagon is the hunter and his hound. Now, the, the, those stars are in the night sky during the winter months. The, the hunter and his hound is a star law motif all across the northern hemisphere, not just Europe, but all across the northern hemisphere. And at the top is the triangle of the summer birds, the, the three birds of the summertime. So the, the three birds of Rhiannon. Um, they're the summer stars. So we're descending now into the darker months. We're descending into winter. So the winter stars of the hunter and his hound are going to start appearing as we get closer and closer to the winter solstice. In the middle between the summer triangle and the winter hexagon is the W shape. That's the mother goddess um, made with the antlers of Canunus and his stag. The picture on the right, I called it waiting for the hunt. And it's deliberately pointing at what we're going into. So we've the elder tree <clears throat> took us to the autumn equinox, and then we've descended into the mysteries. Now we're on the other side of the equinox. The first theater, the first song, the first story of this time of the year is the preparating, preparing for the hunt, the hunt that's gonna come for Samhain. So the three dogs are a nod to the dogs of the wild hunt. And I've also done three to just kind of acknowledge Cerebus guarding the other world. Um, and above the head of the dog on the left-hand side is the sign of Libra. And you go through those six, zodiac signs of Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, winter solstice, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, and then we're back 
into spring equinox and the lighter half of the year. So this is almost a map of the next six months, the next six zodiac signs that we're going to be hunting off towards. So <clears throat> taking those ideas on board, then the main symbol for the Celtic otherworld or the fairy tradition in the British Isles, and that includes Ireland, um, all of the British Isles, it is the white stag or the heart. You know, just like in the tales of Narnia, where Aslan the lion is the king of the beasts, you know, the white heart is that for the all of the British Isles and the Isle of Ireland. You know, that the stag represents the wild. Now, that will make more sense a little bit further on because there is the domestic reality and there is the wild reality. There is being wide awake physically and being in the outer world where it's tame and domesticated. And then there's the visionary world of being fast asleep or on a shamanic journey. And that's the wild as well. You know, all of those deep archetypal images of visions and dreams is also the wild, you know. So it's a time of year, but there's also states of reality, if you like, for the mind. In Brythonic mythology, the Lord of the Wild Hunt is Gwynap Neath. And um, yeah, the painting of mind there on the left hand side, his laws wrapped up in Glastonbury folklore, but also Welsh folklore. Um, Somerset was Welsh before it was taken over by the Saxons, you know, so the old name for Glastonbury is Unis Witchery, the Isle of Glass, and the god, the pagan god of that area was the winter hunter. And what happens throughout the winter months in Glastonbury, from the market cross in the centre of town, and also from the Iron Age Lake Village, if you're standing at those locations, the constellation of Orion, the winter hunter, comes out of Glastonbury Tor and goes hunting, you know. So the winter hunter, the night sky, the stars of the winter hexagon are played out in that landscape. And that's going to be quite important too. Stars coming out of the hills is really important for understanding Celtic tribal landscape ideas. On the right hand side, it's just a young male figure with antlers. It's no one in, it's not meant to be anyone in specifically. But in Ireland, the equivalent of Gwynap Neath is the culture hero in English known as Finn McCool, uh, a famous. Um, leader of warriors who go hunting. Um, his warriors are called the Fianna, and they're incredible martial art gymnasts who live in the forests. And one of the main stories I heard last year was that they actually lived in the pine forest and they prepared to hunt in the pine forests. Now, the reason the antlers fit Finn McCall so well is that elsewhere in his stories, um, he has a fairy wife who was a deer. She, the story says that a bad druid turned her into a deer uh, and Finn helps her become human, uh, have a human form, and they fall in love and they're together. And, and they... She gets pregnant, but she gets taken away by the bad druid and Finn loses her. You know, he pines for her. He can't find her. He goes looking for her. But the point is, is that she was half fairy, half deer. And then the story unfolds that eventually he finds a young boy and recognizes his own features in the young boy and realizes that 
the young boy is his son. And he names the young boy Oshin, who becomes a famous poet like Taliesin in Wales. And Oshin means little deer. So although Finn McCall isn't described as being an antelope god, his wife is a deer and his son is a little deer. So by default, that makes him a stag lord, you know, um, just ideas there. So the, the thing then with, um, what's the next picture? Yeah, the, the thing then with Finn McCall and the Fianna, the warriors, preparing to hunt in the pine woods, very, very interesting because here's how tribal people in the Celtic world kind of lived with their landscape. Predominantly, a tribal group would live around a river. They needed that river for fresh drinking water, for cooking, for washing, and so on. So the domesticated life of the village or the tribe was always close to the river. You know, that's the river so important. So the river is the life giving goddess as well. And then their agriculture would be slightly uphill away from the river, you know, so they'd be using the lowlands nearby for growing their crops. So that's the red bull of summer. The bull and the summer and the farming are relatively low down in the valley of the river. The hunting, on the other hand, was on the spaces between tribal territories, which were the ridges and hilltops between river valleys. So the hunting activities of tribal groups happened in the hilltops, and the hilltops were predominantly the pine trees, you know, so the landscape then is defining things. You're living by the river because the river is the river of life. And then you're farming close to your village. And then a bit higher up the hill, animals will be grazing, sheep and goats and cows. And then way up high is the pine trees and the wild hunt and hunting animals that are not domesticated like the deer sort of thing. So that's interesting then that if you think of being down in the valley and looking at the stars and the winter hunter coming out of the hill, you know, the stars are directly above the pine trees. But the pine trees are some sort of liminal space between the normal everyday world and the star world, the spirit world. You know, the pine trees are there. Now, the, the reason I put this book cover in it's a quirky book about a chap called Tony Wedd, who, as the title says, was a New Age pioneer. But if you look at the front cover, it's got pine trees silhouetted on it. And the reason for that is a strange observation that Tony Wedd made, I think, back in the 1970s. And it was this. It was that for the most part not all not always but most of the time when there were reported sightings of ufos they were above pine trees on hilltops and he led tony wedd to speculating whether there was something energetical about pine trees that resonated with ufo appearances now, i mean it sounds a bit bonkers all of that, but modern kind of landscape mysteries uh, contemplate what they now call plasma, which is intelligent energy released by tectonic plates and movements underground, you know, and that these plasma energy can be balls of light or, or you know, will-o'-the-wisps, and which are gases, but, you know, there's something there that somehow just like the pine trees being on the ridge of the hill and then it's a star world, or that they're facilitating paranormal activity in some way, 
is really interesting as it's the tree of the threshold, the, the tree leading into the wild, if you like. Really interesting. So energetically in the body, there's also those processes going on. Um, first of all, we're into Libra and Libra corresponds with your kidneys and the kidneys is the kind of production of life force and chi for your lower cauldron. But what's happened then throughout the year, as far as the anatomy of the zodiac goes, you know, from the winter solstice, um, energy rises up the spinal cord to the back of the neck, to the pineal gland for summer solstice. And that was the last ACMA, stop, born of summer solstice. So then the previous ACMA, there's the beginning of this descending of energy from Cancer the Crab and Leo the Lion. There's this kind of energy coming down from the pineal gland into Leo governing the heart to the middle cauldron. And then from Leo and the middle cauldron, energy descends into Virgo. And Virgo is your intestines and your digestive system. So the granary floor of Virgo, the cereal goddess, that's the bread in the belly, the grain in the belly, if you like, you know. And then we're into Libra. So then we've gone from Leo, the heart, to Virgo, the digestive system, into Libra, the kidneys. So we've descended energetically towards the power production of the lower cauldron. And then at Samhain, Scorpio, we're into the genitals. And then we're going further down into the bones of the feet and down, down to eventually to the, the soles of the feet and Pisces, the fish. But there's this kind of sinking downwards uh, into the, the lower. Uh, the yin-yang symbol fits the cycle of the Celtic year quite well. So... Um, on the left, you've got the autumn equinox. And so at Lunasa, just below, um, you can see how the, the, you know, the nights are getting darker and then you get to autumn equinox and then you're into the dark completely. And the winter solstice is at 12 o'clock. So Samhain is the heart of that darkness. That's where the wild hunt is. And then following the winter solstice, there's the stillness and the energy of rising, and then we're into in bulk, and the lighter days are coming back, and then you're at spring equinox, but it's played out nicely. And um, the name Gwyn up neath, the winter hunter, actually means white son of night. So that fits really well with the white circle inside the dark yang, uh, dark yin part of the yin and yang symbol. Now, what I wanted to draw attention to today, is like later on we do a little meditation and it, this applies to meditating as well as going to sleep. So the space then between this world and the other world, or this world and the fairy world, or this world and the psychic paranormal world or being awake and being asleep, it, it applies to all of it. There has to be a kind of liminal space between the realities, if you like. So this main circle here is the pattern of sleep. So the whiter half at the top is being wide awake, you know? And then when you fall asleep, the arrow coming down on the right-hand side, the liminal space between being awake and being asleep is called the hypno hypnagogic space and easy to remember because it's got go in it so you're going to sleep so hypnagogic hypnagogic the dreams you have in that hypnagogic area are the weird dreams they're kind they tend to be jumbly and garbled and it's very much the kind of brain defragmenting all of the stuff of the day that's just happened you know, it can be visionary. It's visionary with shamanic things. But generally speaking, as a normal sleep pattern, 
it's the brain defragmenting and garbling things and just letting stuff go and jingling it around. When you get right down to the bottom of the circle, you're in deep sleep. And in deep sleep, there's no dreaming at all. Um, that's what the, the brain wave is, the delta wave. It's deep restorative healing, uh, not dreaming. Now, apparently, most people dream four times a night, whether they re remember the dreams or not. You know, that, that generally happens four times a night, whether you remember it or not. So you're not in deep sleep all the time. You're, you're hovering between delta and theta. The theta is the dreaming space. So your brain is still kind of active because you're dreaming or you're having shamanic visions. You know, you're seeing stuff, you're, you're experiencing things. Whereas in delta, you're, you're out, you're completely out. You know, your brain is just snoring its head off. So the theta brain waves are the dreams and the visions. So when we do a meditation, we're trying to relax the brain down to the theta brain waves to try and see some dreaming imagery. On the left hand side, when you're waking up, that's the hypnopompic area. And that's really interesting because generally speaking, just as much as the hypnagogic threshold is garbled dreams the hypnopompic is very different it's when you might wake up with premonitions musicians will wake up with a whole song in their head or a, or a, an artist will have a, a picture in their mind or a poet will have lines of verse you know that somehow during the hypnopompic threshold between the sleep and awake you're getting guidance from somewhere. You know, you're, you're getting treasures from somewhere, the other world or whatever you want to call it, the inner world. And the brain needs to do that. Now, so we're drifting in and out of delta and theta at least four times a night on average for most people. And this to me is equally winter and summer halves of the year you know that being awake energetically is spring like spring equinox to summer solstice full light of day wide awake eyes wide open and then autumn equinox there's a descending the nights are getting darker and all the rest of it you know and that's just exactly the same as going to sleep energetically was you know so the wide awake half of the wheel is all of the farming and the busy activity. And then the darker months are not like that. So back to Finn McCool and the Fianna, the, the warriors of Ireland that lived on the ridges between tribal territories. They defended the land, but they lived wild in the forests on the hilltops, you know, and they would do the hunting leading up to Samhain, from, from autumn equinox to Samhain would be the wild hunt time, you know? But then after Samhain, and the law of heather and aspen and yew kind of go along with this too, the, even Finn McCool and the Fianna, they would retire. They would retire from the hilltops. And during the winter months, they would live in a village that they would winter in a village or a tribal group next to a river because it's far too harsh, far too cold. And, and the villagers would look after them because they'd been defending them all year round, you know? So for the winter months, they get to snuggle up into a, a house and then keep nice and warm. And then I guess around about in bulk or spring equinox, they they go back to the wild. They go back to hunting on the hilltops and stuff. So there is that kind of law in Celtic culture, which can also be applied to one's brain and one's mentality of being awake in consensus reality and then being in the other world or the inner world with your dream, visionary, spirit world reality you know 
and quite interesting that the other brain waves alpha is just chilled out relaxed listening to music watching tv you know strumming a guitar that's the alpha wave beta is when you're busy busy you're running around doing things and and sorting things out and, and being a parent or, or whatever and most people are either beta or alpha and then once in a while can happen you can get into the gamma waves and that's visionary that's inspired consciousness or you could even say imbus or arwen but so the brain then as well as being awake and going to sleep and waking up again it can also go from gamma to beta to alpha to theta and to delta you know all of those things are happening in a 24 hour cycle you know and, and that relates to the year too uh, anyway, enough of that. It's just some ideas about preparing to hunt uh, and the wild hunters in the hilltops and the pine ridges. So pine medicine, then. The main medicine from the pine tree is its needles. And the needles you can buy online is pine needle tea. Um, they're very, very high in vitamin C. Um, apparently five times higher than lemon and orange, you know, so better vitamin C than the citrus fruits. Also high in vitamin A, which is good for your eyesight. So what pine needle tea benefits is it benefits allergies, general immunity boost. It's an antidepressive, antidepressant. Um, it reduces high blood pressure. It's good for coughs and colds, sore throats. Primarily, it cleanses the lungs and eases respiratory problems. So if you've got asthma or something, it's going to help with breathing. Or if you've got bronchitis or something, it's going to help loosen up the lungs and get the breath back in. So that's the medicine from the pine tree, from its needles. And that can be... Uh, harvested and done all year round. Um, lots of mushrooms grow under pine trees, um, loads of them. So I, I just chose one, which is a quite a common one, and, and that's the chanterelle mushroom. It's an edible mushroom. It's not a hallucinogenic one, even though it looks a bit weird. It's actually a, a, a very healthy food mushroom. Um, and it grows predominantly under pine trees, but pine looks after so many mushrooms. Now you can get chanterelle mushrooms all year round. They do tend to come up around now, September, October, but you can buy them dried all year round. And uh, the magic that they do is they actually help protect the cells of the body from um, disintegrating, you know, from uh, harm from free radicals and stuff. So that they, they they support cells in the body, uh, which stimulates the immune system, and they're high in all sorts of B vitamins, and they've been proven to help against some, not all, not all, but some cancers. Um, so rather special mushroom throughout the year, all of these mushrooms, the health benefits are astounding, really. If they're not anti-tumor and anti-cancer, they're helping the brain and they're helping with Alzheimer's and dementia and things like that. So we really need more mushrooms in our life. So now we're into October. I couldn't pick a wild flower. <laughs> you know, they're just not. That there might be some very obscure ones, but there's no common wild flowers now. That every, everything's kind of dying off. So I went back to thinking about Caradwen and her cauldron because that was the initial inspiration for looking at uh, flower, wild flowers, and herbal medicine throughout the year. And what the story actually says, rather than flowers. In the English translation by Lady Charlotte Guest, it actually says, all charm-bearing herbs. 
So I thought about that. So it's not necessarily flowers of that moment in time, but what are the charm bearing herbs available during the days of pine? So then I went outside the box a little bit and I thought, well, what's instead of looking at what wildflowers there are now, because as we get closer to winter solstice, there's going to be less and less. I thought, well, what foraging is available? What, what's the foraging right now? And I took these photographs today. All, all of the following photographs I took today. Um, of course, everywhere is different. So I'm on the island of Guernsey and uh, foraging available in Cornwall and Somerset is going to be different to what's available in Scotland and Ireland. You know, so, so everyone's neck of the wood and in other countries across the world, you know, so it is very subjective. This is just what's in my neck of the woods at the moment that's available for foraging. Now, this wonderful old girl is on the farm where I work, and we call her Old Mother Chestnut. It's like an old winter hag with antlers, you know, she, she, but she's brilliant. And she's very, very old. Um, if you look to the right of her, you can see the rest of her trunk. She's much wider than her face looks. She, she's hundreds and hundreds of years old. And just below her on the ground are chestnuts. They're falling off the tree right now. Um, these ones are a bit small. They're not ideal for cooking. You want them a bit bigger, but these are the early ones falling off a bit prematurely. Um, but they're a great food source, the sweet chestnut. And Throughout the next few weeks is the perfect time to go gathering them. Um, don't confuse them with horse chestnut. These are sweet chestnut. Um, and they're full of nutritious things, lots of vitamins and minerals. Specifically, they're good for the heart and they have anti-cancer properties. Um, they're a great food. I, 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 I like them roasted and I put a little bit of gravy with them. And I've made chestnut pasties with them you know they're great um, apples of course this this is on the farm we've got apple trees and the apples are ready for picking so many health benefits of apple of course you know the famous thing an apple a day keeps a doctor away um one of the things that it does is it stabilizes blood sugar levels so for people with diabetes this is a great thing you should have two or three apples a day to stabilize your blood sugar levels, which is strange because it is a fruit. It has fructose. But if you eat the whole apple, don't, don't drink apple juice, but drink the whole apple and have the fiber with it. It will stabilize blood sugar levels. Also chew the pips. The pips are really good for you. Hawthorn is ready for gathering the hawthorn berries. So we've already looked at the hawthorn tree, but that was back in the spring when it had blossoms, you know? So here's the hawthorn berry, perfect for foraging right now. Uh, well attested as being good for heart disease and the blood and blood flow and circulation, uh, and will also reduce high blood pressure. So time now for foraging hawthorn berries and they can be dried to last all year now this green thing it's not ready to thaw yet but in the next few weeks it will this is a walnut so we've got a few walnut trees and the, they look like green plums and when they hit the ground the green flesh decays and you've got the walnut inside uh, walnuts good for the brain of course uh, very nutritious for lots of things but you could be gathering in the next now or in the next few weeks, sweet chestnuts, hawthorn berries, walnuts, and apples. Well, apple and walnut is a good mixture, you know. And then finally, I saw this today, and I have had one already. Well, I haven't had it, I, I had a little bit. This is called um, Amanita pantherina, also known as panther cap. So it's part of the Amanita family, and it's more potent than fly agaric Amanita muscaria. Um, again, you have to be very careful with it. You have to dry it really thoroughly so that it's as dry as a biscuit, biscuit dry. And then you can crumble just a little bit. Now, 
microdosing fly agaric, you don't want more than a thumbnail. Literally, your your thumb's nail that much is enough microdose of fly agaric for the health benefits. I'm not I'm not encouraging having out of body experiences and big hallucinogenic trips. I'm talking about the the repair to the nervous system and post-traumatic stress disorder and depression and anxiety. So it helps with those things. But panther cap even stronger, even more potent, even more hallucinogenic. And the micro dose, I would say, would be half your thumbnail, tiny, you know. And um, I have micro dosed it. it. What was it like? I didn't have any weird dreams, but I just did it in the daytime. And the few times I've done it, it made me feel a little bit dopey, a little bit floaty. Um, and that was about it. But it's meant to be good for restoring nervous disorders and the neurological system and stuff. You know, in my experience so far, you feel a bit dopey for a, an hour and a half, maybe two hours, and that's it. You're back to clarity. So, uh, but that was small that was like half a thumbnail literally you know not a very nice taste quite bitter so i just kind of chewed it in my mouth and then washed it down with water and had some chewing gum just to get rid of the taste you know but, um yeah so again that's what's forageable at the moment and uh yeah and again go so i'll s stop sharing i'll leave the recording on but you can put your microphones on and we can talk about those ideas. Well, one thing that jumped out at me was that you used the word he's pining for something, you know, the, that <laughs> phrase. And, uh, you know, that phrase, does that come from the pine tree, for example? I don't know. And, uh, yeah. Dionysus had a magic wand with a pine cone on the top. It was famous, isn't it? And and it's meant to relate to the pineal gland at the top of the spine. Yeah. So, but the pine cone's been used in ancient Mesopotamia. You've got the bird-headed mm -hmm. temple guards with little buckets and pine cones. Mm -hmm. and kind of sprinkling holy water on the temple. So, so that's long before that. the, Luz the Luzinian mysteries. So maybe that's desire, uh, pining for something. If you pine for something, is that desire? Then that would uh, fit with Dionysius and maybe not as much with Finn McCool's uh, need for his wife to be back, but um, yeah. That makes sense. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I'm talking so much, but I have another offering here, which is yeah. it's interesting that right now we are in the time of year where people tend to get a cold. Like I just got one the other day and the immune system is struggling with the seasonal transition and the changes of temperature and everything. And so here we have this incredibly beneficial pine needles that is just totally attending to these seasonal transition disorders, um, you know, also antidepressant. So which is the you know, the lowering of the light and stuff. So it's cleansing the lungs, easing respiration. I mean, I'm, I'm about ready to just go out right now and harvest me some pine needles. You know, I think that's what I need. We've got quite a few pine trees on the farm here. And, you know, we've been gathering branches and fallen pine cones for the real fire. And there's such a brilliant firewood. You know, the pine mm -hmm. cones are wonderful for getting the fire going as kindling when mm -hmm. they're dry and stuff. So I'm thinking again of the hunters living on the ridges of the hills in the pine woods. They can make their camp. You know, you've got soft pine needles as a floor to, to sit on. You've got your campfire, you've got your pine cones for making the fire and everything mm. you need is there in the pine forest. I love the idea of walking in a pine forest and then giving off these wonderful sort of natural oils into the air and you inhaling that, you know, what I can feel myself walking through and just, you know, inhaling these beautiful, is it pineal? I can't remember what they are, what the oils are, but they're really beneficial for the lungs and for, you know, antibacterial, antiviral. It's really what we need. You know, like you said, and right now, 
you know. Mm -hmm. um, like thinking of mystery school teachings and esoteric <clears throat> teachings that you might teach students, I think there's external star law cosmology and there's internal cosmology mm -hmm. as processes in the body. So from that perspective, the Milky Way is also the spinal cord and the three birds of the summer time are the pineal gland uh, and the crown chakra and the winter hunter and the, the wild hunts down at the bottom, it's your root chakra and stuff. So there's this energetically, there's this descending into the wild hunt energetically into the lower cauldron. And then the salmon's leap will bring it all the way back up to the head, you know, that this cycle so you have the year cycle, but there's also a cycle of breathing. And then I would extend that when you're doing a shamanic journey, you're literally descending. You're literally going, a shamanic journey is literally going on a wild hunt. To, you're going into the other world to hopefully bring back mm -hmm. something beneficial for the tribe, aren't you? You know, that that's the basic shamanic idea. Mm. Uh, and that brings me back to your chart, which was wonderful about the sleep with the hypnogogic um, descent and everything. And at the bottom of the chart, you had delta and at the very top of the chart, you had gamma. And if you think of it as the yin yang, because um, you mentioned, I have got a note here, gamma inspired consciousness. And then um, delta is, well, deep restoration, but it also contains potential for those. Yeah. You may not yeah. That, that, I mean, that's interesting, like from a Tai Chi background, and this is poetic rather than embodied, it's a poetic idea, but they they talk about yin, so the very, very deepest, darkest, they talk about yin being the mother of yang. Mm. So the, the highest brilliance of the crown chakra is born of yin. So somehow it comes from the root and the core up your Milky Way spine to your three birds, and that's your Imbus or Arwen moment, you know. So there's, gosh, you know, there's the outer world macrocosm doing that in the heavens, and then internally that's your microcosm as well. And it's all wisdom that tribal elders could teach by their river in their tribal land, isn't it, you know? Uh, amazing it lined up perfectly yeah simple i mean the, we're talking complicated things but it's simple motifs really and it fits in with the salmon's leap uh when you think about it the salmon leaping all the way back to the crown chakra that that wonderful uh vision you've given us is the same uh cycle and look behind md uh md ray look at her yin yang she's got it right there yeah. the head wants the heart right <laughs> um yeah i like the yin yang i do tai chi gong every monday i, I got to you know, i kind of saw the elder tree as the wise elder and one of the things that i think that wisdom teaches the younger people is how to preserve things so if you don't have that knowledge, if you're if you're a bunch of young people with no elders, you don't know how to preserve things and make them last all year. So then the foraging for chestnuts and drying mushrooms and hawthorn berries and pine needles, if, if you don't know the preserving knowledge, how are you going to get through the winter? You know, so it it's the knowledge of the elders that pass that on as well. And it's interesting. Yeah, I, I wanted to come back to sorry. Andy, go on. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, if you can hear me, hopefully. Um, I was gonna say this going back to that thing with the you know, the pines being on like the in the liminal space between the waking and the sleeping, or between the other world and the kind of village world. And then going back to what I said or well, mentioned earlier before about the pine trees being all around the North Pole area. Yeah, brilliant. Of the of the northern hemisphere. It's quite trippy to think that, you know, how the realms kind of like got them around and what is actually beyond that, you know. I mean, we don't really know. Well, I don't anyway. It's quite quite an exciting thought to me. 
we got the pine trees all around the pole star area, which is the center of the heavenly kingdom, isn't it? it was everything, all those constellations are going around the pole star. Yeah. And then totally. you, you're also going to have the northern lights and all that weird yeah. spacey stuff yeah. going above the pine trees. Weird <laughs> paranormal activity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've often contemplated that trees are chi generators, that they don't just breathe for us, yes. they generate chi, is a, a belief I have. I can't prove it because it's hard to prove chi exists, but I see them as chi <laughs> generators. And so it was really interesting to come across that New Age book about this guy who related pine trees to UFO sightings. I just thought that was quite fascinating. And, you know, another thing on that level is like the, uh, it, you know, with pines being so straight in how they reach for heaven, you know, from a yin yang perspective, yeah. it's like they're a, a, mo a tree that's most kind of in the heavenly energy because they're so directly reaching for heaven. Yeah. You know, that's kind of how I've been thinking about it. And um, yeah, and then getting into some of the research about like anti parasite stuff with the turpentines and, um, people using turpentines to like cleanse from uh to cleanse from um yeah parasites basically there's a there's a, uh, mm -hmm. there's a you can search on youtube for this woman called dr andrew isn't that it's daniel daniels dr daniels an african-american woman she, quite amazing research she's been doing and um yeah basically i think that fits in again with the pines being like super all about life and all about that kind of heavenly side of life of like having a very anti-parasitic effect mm -hmm. you know in the sense that it's a very pure kind of form of life very simple very pure like i don't know yeah that's just a few thoughts from some of the research i've been doing yeah all right then it's nearly quarter past eight so if if you i'll stop recording if you put your microphones off we'll do the meditation to the pine tree Thank mm -hmm. you.